I'll introduce uh, John Radovich, who's uh, one of our board members of Texas Rail Advocates and past president. John. Howdy. Thank you. Welcome to Dallas. I appreciate uh, everybody's participation here. This is a team effort. Uh, we can't do it without y'all, uh, and we look to look forward to more rail transportation in Texas and all the different modes. Uh, Mr. Ellis is going to be our next speaker. He uh, started out in the industry as a switchman for the IC in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, moved up uh, to the CNW Chicago area. Came to Texas for Railtex, uh, which was the contractor for DART for DG&O. And uh, that's where I met Ed uh, a couple of decades ago. And we've uh, consorted ever since on different things. Uh, Today, he owns nine short-line railroads through Iowa Pacific Holding and three in the, th nine in the U.S., uh, three in the United Kingdom. Uh, he did a short stint at Amtrak where he developed Mail and Express, but uh, his passion in the short-line industry and passenger operations, uh, which is a little bit unusual for most uh, short-lines, uh, is going to, you're going to hear about it today. So, Mr. Ellis. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate everybody uh, sitting through another Ed Ellis speech. I really, Peter and John do, and the whole team do a great job with this program, but they can't seem to find anybody to replace me. So I came back for another year. And I, I want to start by uh, just mentioning that during this talk, I'm probably going to use the word Amtrak a few times, and I don't want anybody to think that um, that it's a negative thing. In fact, um, to badly paraphrase uh, Shakespeare, I come not to bury Joe Boardman, but to praise him. Um, because if you think about it, the, the long distance train network was 15 trains when Joe came in, and it's still 15 trains. And it didn't go down. Uh, it went down under the gun administration. We actually lost uh, New York, Chicago services, and we lost the California piece of the Texas Eagle. So, you know, uh, Joe Boardman has preserved national network, and we have expanded uh, the short distance network under uh, the Boardman administration. So, even though there are a lot of things about Amtrak that um, we can discuss changing, I think that. The, the reality is that for the last several years, the network has been relatively stable. And even though we would all like to see it grow, uh, stable is worse than some of the alternatives. So Iowa Pacific uh, is nine railroads in the US, a little bit different map from last year. We, um, we sold two railroads in the Texas oil field, which turned out to be a timely maneuver on our part, given the price of oil. And we acquired a railroad in Mississippi and one in North Carolina. And so we are uh, coast to coast. And we do uh, some kind of passenger services on most of these railroads. And we all do pa also do passenger services in other places. So um, first, let's talk about the state of play for private rail passenger operations. How many private rail passenger operators are there in the US? One. How many trains a week? Eight. That's not even a train every day. And how many total rail cars do we have in service? Four. How, how, many of you, how many of you got a train under the Christmas tree when you were a kid? Raise your hand if you got a train under the Christmas tree. OK, if you're like me, you looked at that train and that loop of track and said, this would be a whole lot better if I had some more track and some more trains. It's the way we feel about, about this. Um, we, we have the starter set of inner city passenger trains right now. We run the Hoosier State between Chicago and Indianapolis. We make four round trips a week. Um, but it is a delightful opportunity to see what happens when you try to do something different. And so we've learned a lot about what it takes to run pa private passenger trains. So <clears throat> what are the components of private passenger operation? Well, first, of course, is access to the infrastructure and facilities. So infrastructure, that's a way of saying class one freight railroad. And so only Amtrak really has that. But, but we'll talk about that. Rolling stock. You've got to have a train in order to go. Compliance. 
a business plan, and funding. So let's go through each one of those. So to start with, as I said, only Amtrak has compelled access to the infrastructure. They got that in the Rail Passer Service Act of 1970. So the, the railroads can say we don't have room, and Amtrak can say yes you do, and they get into an argument about it, but at the end of the day, if Amtrak wants to run a train and maybe has some capital for upgrades, class one railroads pretty much have to run the train for them. They don't have to run the train for anyone else. They don't have to run it for a state agency. They don't have to run it for the city of Dallas. They don't have to run it for me. Uh, Amtrak is the only one that has compelled access. So <clears throat> one way to look at this is you kind of have to partner with Amtrak in order to be a private operator. And the easiest way to do that is actually the way that the state of Indiana did it. They made a deal with Amtrak, they made a deal with us. What does Amtrak provide? They provide the track access agreement that they have with the freight railroads and a train crew. Well, they actually also provide access to some stations. So um, Amtrak owns Chicago Union Station. So if you want to go into Chicago Union Station, it doesn't matter whether you're Metra or the state of Illinois, you have to negotiate a deal with Amtrak if you're going to go into Chicago Union Station. If you, if you want to go into Chicago, but you don't really care what station you go into, there are plenty of other stations. I personally like LaSalle Street Station, which is uh, owned and operated by Metra, uh, and has nine rush hour trains and eight tracks. So you would think there might be some capacity there. There are other stations, Northwestern Station in Chicago. So, uh, but Amtrak, if, if you want to get into a station that Amtrak owns, uh, if you're a state, PREA 217 gives you access. Well, the provisions of the Passenger Rail Investment Improvement Act 2008 gave states the ability to outsource functions to people like me and part of the deal is if they need something from Amtrak under Section 217, Amtrak has to make a deal with them or else they can take Amtrak to the Service Transportation Board. So when we put together the Indiana deal, obviously one other thing that Amtrak provided was access to the stations that they own, lease, operate. So how would a private operator do this without Amtrak? Well, obviously, you have to go out and negotiate all these things. It's, if, you're, if you're Texas Central Railroad and you're going to build your own entire infrastructure, you don't really worry about that because you're not going to have any interaction with, with anybody except maybe some wealthy landowners who hate you. So, but if you're us, we have to go negotiate with the freight railroads in order to have access to track, and we would have to negotiate with the owner of whatever stations we want to use to have access to the stations. Rolling stock. Now, as we all know, Amtrak owns a lot of rolling stock, superliners, Amfleet cars, Horizon cars, Viewliners, Heritage cars, and the Acela. The Acela is actually the only passenger carrying equipment that's under 20 years old. Um, the superliners were built in 1980 or 1992, depending on whether they're ones or twos. The Amfleet 1 cars were built in the early 70s. The Amfleet 2 cars a little later than that. The Viewliners in the early 90s. So you think about the Amtrak fleet. All of those things I just mentioned are older than the cars that Amtrak inherited when it started in 1971. That's kind of shocking. you know. In 1971, everybody was saying, well, we're going to bring in Amtrak and we're going to get rid of all this old junk. Well, the old junk was mostly built between 1949 and 1966. So it was a lot younger than the old junk we're running now. And to make matters worse, the stuff that Amtrak has is extremely high mileage. They've done a very good job of utilization, and so it's subject to a high failure rate. When I was at Amtrak, the the planned bad order percentage for cars and locomotives was 20%. And that's when the Superliner 2s were brand new. I, I, I started Amtrak in 1996. The Superliner 2s had just finished coming off the line. The Viewliners were still coming off the line. 20% planned bad order ratio. That means one out of every five pieces of equipment you have is over here where somebody can work on it, not running in a train. On the Hoosier State, I have um, four passenger cars, and every day we run four passenger cars. Um, and as you can see, they're painted in 
my favorite paint scheme. I grew up in Paducah. I started with the Illinois Central. And when the Illinois Central ran the city of New Orleans between Chicago and New Orleans, they had exactly two observation cars that they ran on that train. I have a consist of the city of Miami from 1962. They have the names of every car that's going to be in the train all winter long in the consist that they put out to the mechanical department. And they expected that when they got to the other end of the line, whatever was wrong with them, didn't matter whether it was wheels or brakes or air conditioning or whatever, that they were going to turn those cars around and they were going to be the train coming back the next day. That's not the way, well, it is kind of the way Metro does it. They don't really, Metro, I was just at a Metro meeting two days ago and they were talking about the fact that in Chicago, Metro has almost, um, I guess, 800 commuter cars and they, their, their reserve fleet for 800 commuter cars is 3%. And those cars, some of those cars, were built in 1950. I'm talking about cars that are 65 years old that are in service every day. And they did point out that the biggest problem they have is doors, which makes sense because when you get on the train in the wintertime, you're bringing all that salt on your shoes and it's getting in those sliding door mechanisms and it's a problem. But in spite of that, they run those trains 96% on time with a 3% mechanical reserve fleet. So rolling stock's important and we have options. We have lots of options. Well, not really. But we, we can use state-supplied rolling stock. So if, if you're working on a deal to run a train with the state and the state owns their own cars, like they do in California or North Carolina, you can say to the state, how about if we use your cars and we'll run the train? Um, we can also use new rolling stock. Sure, we can just go call up Siemens, Ehrman. Um, I need three train sets. What do you mean you hung up on me? I don't. Well, there is the possibility, anyway, of buying new rolling stock. All it takes is a giant checkbook or at least a giant balance in a small checkbook. And, but that's not realistic either. So where we are is we have heritage rolling stock that's been upgraded to be compliant. I'll talk about compliance on the next slide. But one of the things that, that Iowa Pacific did when we started thinking about the fact that there were a lot of states that were going to want state-supported services and that we might have an opportunity to supply some rolling stock, we went out and bought a lot of cars. And if you, you, know, if you can picture, um, you know, maybe a thousand miles west of here out in the New Mexico desert, some airport that's got a thousand planes sitting out there waiting for somebody to call and say, I need a 727. That's what we did. We got that in the way of railroad cars and out there in the desert in Colorado, we have a lot, a lot of cars waiting for somebody to say, <clears throat> we need some coaches. And so the rolling stock that we're using on the Hoosier State is all cars that actually were either owned by Amtrak or Autotrain and have been used um, off and on for as much as 60 years, just like the metric cars. Except we think of our cars as being considerably lower mileage because Amtrak threw them out in the 80s. Auto train went bankrupt. The mileage on those cars since then has been pretty low. And we've made a good investment in them. So that's how we're surviving with four cars and basically 100% of them in service every day. So then we get to compliance. And the picture here um, this is an interesting story. That's a pit that we built. Uh, you kind of see the rails on top of it. Um, when, we, when we had to prove compliance, we had to invite the Federal Railroad Administration and Amtrak out to look at our rolling stock. Um, so Amtrak was not exactly being completely cooperative with the state of Indiana. So um, when we got ready to schedule the inspection of the equipment, we said, well, let's move it down to the, um, to the Amtrak coach yard in Chicago. They're all Amtrak qualified cars. And we'll have an inspection you know, over an Amtrak pit. And Amtrak said, well, the problem with that is the state of Indiana can't come because they, they can't have access to our coach yard because they don't have an insurance policy that will protect us in case something bad happens. And I said, well, okay, we'll make them agents of Iowa Pacific because we have that agreement with you. And they said, no, no, you're going to have to inspect the cars somewhere else. So it was January, and we didn't really have a somewhere else. So we dug a pit in Bensonville so that we could get Amtrak and FRA out there to look at the cars, which they did. And they found 
things wrong with them, which we fixed, and they came back and looked again, and they found different things wrong that they didn't find the first time, and we fixed those two, and we eventually got it all fixed, and we started running the train. And what they were looking at was things like 49 CFR 238, which is a description of everything that your passenger car has to have or do in order to be compliant with today's regulations. And 238 is something that was developed over a number of years, and basically whenever we had a train accident in this country, somebody sat down and looked at it and said, what caused that accident, and we'll never do that again. I'll give you an example. One of my favorite things in the world, riding down the Illinois Central in the city of New Orleans, was to sit in the club car at the back of the train and take that big overstuffed chair and turn it around to look out the back. Can't do that anymore. Because under 238, all furniture has to be fixed in place. Not only has to be fixed in place, it has to survive a sled test where they put eight G's against it to see if that'll cause it to move because somebody got hurt by a piece of flying furniture somewhere along the way and they said, we're not going to do that again. So 238 has a whole bunch of stuff in it that covers every aspect of a railroad passenger car, the design, the construction, the maintenance, so that the Federal Railroad Administration's job is to keep you and me safe when we're riding on that car. Everything about 238. 223, bulletproof glass. Well, it's Texas, right? You shoot at everything. So it's got to be bulletproof. Uh, many other items, including uh, everything to do with locomotives, management of operating crews, drug and alcohol, and the FRA also enforces the Americans with Disabilities Act. So this was interesting because um, we had a car that was ADA compliant, or so we thought. So the FRA got in, got their tape measure out, and said, you know, this, this thing right here is six inches off, and this one is two inches off. He said, but Amtrak built this bathroom as an ADA-compliant bathroom. Yes, but they changed the law, so now it's not compliant anymore. Rip it all out, start over again, build a new bathroom. So then they said, well, wait a minute. Your dome car that you're using for business class is not ADA accessible. I said, well, but we have this coach here that is. Yes, but, but you got to have, under the rules, for every, every car has to have at least one accessible space. So, since you have three cars, that means you have to have three accessible spaces. I said, well, we have three accessible spaces in this car. Uh, that's not good enough because you can't have more than two in any one car or it doesn't count. Okay, so let me get this straight. I have three cars. One, two, three. I have two accessible spaces. So, so if I just run two cars, I can run this car that has the two accessible spaces and the dome car. Well, no, 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 because you have to have an accessible business class space. So, well, can I designate one of these spaces as, nope, 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 it's got to be a true business class space. Okay, so that's why we ended up with a fourth car, which is the other, other accessible space, and it's got some business class spaces that are accessible. So then I came down here for a meeting in Fort Worth last year, and I thought, I just want to see how this works on the Heartland Flyer. You don't want to know. It doesn't work that way. It's some completely different way. There's three cars. There's one accessible space. So, but they're still running the train. So we had to deal with that. The Food and Drug Administration, food service, water, even in the bathroom, they check the toilet to make sure that the water that goes into the toilet is certified clean. It's very important. And they also, they also manage uh, the commissary where we, where we uh, put the food together that goes on the train. Um, OSHA manages worker safety, and of course the states get involved. So there is a lot of regulation. We, I learned so much about government regulation last year, way more than I ever wanted to learn about government regulation. So then, after you go through all that, you really ought to have a business plan, right? So you can determine how you're going to come out okay on this. I hope somebody brought the business plan. I'm still looking for it. Passenger trains don't make money. You have to analyze the revenues and expenses. And a lot of the things that we've been talking about are cost centers. Rolling stock, maintenance of the rolling stock. Of course, insurance, we have to meet the federal limit for insurance, which we do. 
Uh, the cost of fuel has actually been something favorable over the last few months because it's gone down, and labor. And so when you go through all that, how do you make the numbers come out? Well, the answer is you have to get funding from somebody. This isn't like the Polar Express. The numbers come out great on the Polar. We made several million dollars on the Polar Express. I hope you guys all went out to Palestine, Texas last winter and rode the Polar Express. If not, tickets are on sale. TSRR.com. Please go ride the Polar Express. But states want inner city trains. There are 19 states, including this one, uh, that support inner city services and many are not satisfied with the services they have today. Uh, in Indiana, it was a five hour trip with no food service, not even a cup of coffee. Can you imagine what would happen if you got on United Airlines and you were gonna fly to Seattle from Dallas and they wouldn't even let you have a cup of coffee? There'd be a revolt, especially among those of us who are addicted to Starbucks, but even pe normal people, there would be a re revolt. So the state of Indiana said, we want something better than what we have today. And so it was, it was the job of those people who responded to their RFP to come up with something better. We were not actually the winners. Uh, the winners um, were Quarter Capital. And between Indiana, Amtrak, and Quarter Capital, they were not able to reach an agreement. So we were the also ran. But we were able to come in and suggest some improvements that we could deliver on. And I would like to say that I, I believe we have delivered on the improvements. One of the main improvements that we promised was improved on time performance. The on time performance um, a year ago in, uh, in November was 47%. Uh, this November it was 82%. So that sounds like a pretty remarkable improvement. What did we do differently from Amtrak to go from 47% to 82%? Keep in mind, it's still their crew. It's still, we're still leaving from their station. So what did we do to make that kind of a change? We did three things. First thing we did was we suggested to Indiana that Amtrak needed to have a fresh crew on every train. It's a five hour trip. The way they were working it, you get on the train in Indianapolis, you go to Chicago, and under the law, you can take four hours off and then start on your way back. But they, because of the time the crew was called and getting the train into the station in Indianapolis, they could only make it back to Lafayette if everything went well. But if there was a freight train in the way, they would end up stopping somewhere in the middle of nowhere where the van driver with the replacement crew couldn't necessarily find them. I was actually on a train that got to Indianapolis at 5.30 in the morning, scheduled arrival time 11.50 p.m. So I experienced it firsthand and thought, this is not the way to do it. So Amtrak, starting in January, put a fresh crew on every train. That was a simple step. Second thing, this is also simple, <clears throat> is have the train inspected, fueled, and ready to go at departure time. Um, almost a fourth of Amtrak delays, you can look this up, it's in their monthly performance reports on their website, um, and, and for a variety of reasons, I'm not shooting Amtrak over this, it's just the reality, it's been the reality for a long time. Almost a fourth of their delays are because the train doesn't leave the station on time. Uh, example, um, the other night, um, our train gets coupled to the Cardinal on Tuesday nights to deadhead down to Indianapolis for the Wednesday morning departure. Train was an hour late leaving Chicago, frozen toilets. Happens frequently. So when that happens, when that train is late leaving, it's usually late arriving. It's hard to make up time in a lot of cases because the railroads say, hey, I don't see the passenger train, let's run a freight train. It's the right thing for them to do. They need to move their freight. So that was the second thing we did. And the, the third thing we did was um, we took one of our operating guys in our National Operations Center and assigned him to call the freight railroad whenever there was a delay so that we could report to Indiana what the cause of the delay was. And we figured, we'll analyze these delays, see if there's a pattern that develops, and then we'll be able to address freight train delays. Well, um, I, don't, I, I think this may have been the Hawthorne effect. I don't know if you've heard of the Hawthorne effect. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great psychological thing, but in the Hawthorne works of Western Electric in Cicero, Illinois, it was one of the first places where they did time and motion studies, and they decided to increase the temperature in the plant to see what the improvement, what, what the change was in productivity. Productivity went up. 
So then they reduced the temperature in the plant, and guess what? Productivity went up again. People were being paid attention to. They weren't sure why, but they thought, you know, they, they want me to do something. I've got to figure this out. And so I think what may have happened with these dispatchers on all these railroads is the Hawthorne effect. They, they were getting, somebody was showing an interest in this particular train, and the result of that has been fewer freight train delays. So I'm not claiming credit for that. Uh, certainly not a dispatcher, um, although I've never run two trains into each other. And I think that having uh, attention paid to the train is good. It's so good that one of the railroads called me and said, we're going to investigate any delay of over five minutes. That's a good thing. So as a result, 47% to 82%. And I think certainly the food service we have is an improvement over the non-food service that was on the train before, no matter what it is. So, so there's going to be more states, and you heard Mr. Stevens talk about the fact that the state of Texas and Oklahoma are looking for something different. There's, going to, there's a lot of states that are looking for something different. So in the bill that just passed, the FAST Act, there's also a provision for the operation, private operation, of up to three long-distance routes. And in order for that to happen, the private operator has to make his or her own deal with the Class 1 railroads. And if you do that, and you say, I want, hold your hand up and say, I want to run this train, the USDOT can provide up to 90% of the subsidy Amtrak receives. So if New Orleans, City of New Orleans gets a $24 million subsidy. So you can do the math on 90% of that. It's pretty, good, it's pretty good money for somebody who's willing to come in and run one train a day from Chicago to New Orleans. But the problem is, on that train or any other train, before you could do it, you got to go make a deal with a Class 1 railroad. And I can tell you that when the 2008 PREA Act came out, there was a similar provision, but it wasn't as good. Um, because in the 2008 law, the, the operator, the private operator, had to be the underlying Class 1 railroad. And I went to a couple of Class 1 railroads and, and said, what do you think? You know, we'll provide the train and the crew and all that. And they said, you know what? We're just not interested. There's not really anything in it for us. And so now, what's different about 2016? What's in it for a Class 1 railroad? Well, a couple things. First, I think what we've been able to demonstrate in Indiana is that a private company like us can develop good relations with the Class 1 railroads and improve on time performance without making major demands of the Class 1 railroads to change things. So um, I think that right now there's a lot of litigation underway. Went to the Supreme Court. The railroad said, Amtrak, you don't have the right to uh, establish on-time performance standards. Amtrak said, yes, we do. It got remanded to a lower court. It looks like Amtrak has got a leg up on that. So there's, there's a possibility that it would be beneficial for a Class 1 railroad to deal with us instead of dealing with Amtrak on some of these routes. It's at least worth checking out and trying. And I will tell you that we have been in contact with several of the Class 1s to bring up the idea that we would like to look at this. I don't really have anything to report there. I'm not going to name any Class 1s, but it is a possibility. And we would certainly be interested in it. So what happens next? Here are some possible outcomes. And I am, uh, I am an optimist, despite the experience. So these are all optimistic outcomes. The first one, Amtrak realizes that private investment can help leverage their assets to provide additional train services, grow the network, and improve their financial situation. So we're sort of a bolt-on to Amtrak. When we put those cars on the Hoosier State, it freed up car the cars that were running on the Hoosier State to do something else. And the more of those kinds of services there are where a private operator provides assets, the easier it is to say, yeah, we have equipment to grow the network. Amtrak's main asset is their, asset, is their access to the Class 1s. And the train crews that they have, that they employ to run those trains because those train crews have qualifications over all of the mainline network of the United States. So leveraging that asset in partnership with private operators could be a good way to grow the number of trains, grow the number of routes, 
and do it in such a way that it's beneficial to the class one railroads. You know, last year when I was here, I talked about some of the problems facing the railroad industry. And one of the things I talked about was the fact that the railroads are highly dependent on moving energy. And that's bad. And what we saw this year was that actually play out because coal is way down, oil is way down, frac sand is way down, and how do the class one railroads afford to maintain and grow their own networks? Well, one way to do that is to partner with a state or even with the federal government to invest money in capacity and improvements in condition on class one railroads. There needs to be a model for that that's beneficial to the class one railroads. This could be it. So another possibility is that states continue to look for alternatives that provide better service, nothing to do with Amtrak, just on their own. And, and I believe that will continue to happen. And finally, it's also possible that private operators like Iowa Pacific make direct access arrangements with track owners to run trains. Um, we've already done that to some extent in Oklahoma. We're waiting for the city of Oklahoma City to uh, arrange for access to downtown Oklahoma City, and we have an arrangement with Waco to use their line into Oklahoma City for local service there. I think there could be a lot more of these. So um, I think that the future is potentially bright for not just for us, but for other private operators of passenger trains, provided that you navigate the torturous waters of Amtrak, the FRA, other regulators, and find a decent source of funding. So thank you for your time. And I don't know if I have time for questions, Peter. Don't have time for questions? OK. Thank you.